hide anybody. You can't. Hello, muted. Court. Hi, Court and Sally. Hello, Alan. Hello, oh, Jim. <laughs> I thought that was a very good class. I appreciated your comments, James. What about this big chair? Yeah. It's kind of clear. I think it's kind of clear. I think we've come a long way as far as being willing to talk about dying and death are concern is concerned. Uh, when Elizabeth Kubler Ross began publishing her I kept pioneering, thinking about that. <laughs> when yeah. she began to publish her pioneering work about um, con consisting of uh, interviews with dying patients at a hospital in Chicago, she got a really mm -hmm. big uh, spread in Look magazine, which had a tremendous circulation at the time about her work. And for her trouble, the hospital in Chicago she was working at fired her for doing that. Really? I they didn't said, want to uh, fired. We, we, we heal people at this hospital. People don't die at this hospital. <laughs> well, that's the thing, you know, big mm -hmm. hospitals do not like deaths under their watch. Right. And we now have a UPMC hospital here in Hanover. And I was told if I had gone there with my COVID and not to the Wellspan in Gettysburg, I would have been told to go home because there was nothing they could do for me. Really? Well, I was at death's door. And that's that that that's one of the ways they handle it very gracefully. You weren't at death's door because you left. <laughs> Jim, I knew you were very ill, but I had no idea that it was that that you were that close. Oh, they called my daughter and my power attorney the Sunday after.
Good morning. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Let us rise in body or in spirit and worship God together using the call to worship. Jesus went to the mountaintop to pray. Jesus went into the city to heal. Jesus walked to Samaria to extend love. Jesus went to the water's edge to teach. Jesus went to places of peace and connection. But Jesus also went to the wilderness. There is nowhere we can go that God does not walk with us. We are in God's house. Let us worship holy God. Please join me in the opening prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, our divine parent, may your presence be ever revered. May your peace and justice dwell among us. May your love and compassion live within and between us. Nourish us daily with the necessities of life 
sustenance for our bodies, and inspiration for our spirits. And may the forgiveness we give be that which we receive, the kindness we show be that which we perceive. Lead us on virtuous paths and distance us from evil, for your world is our world and your reign our reign, now, now, and always. May it be so. Friends, we worship a God who doesn't keep score and who doesn't hold grudges. We worship a God who invites us into a richer faith, a deeper love, a more compassionate existence with a million chances to try again. So let us speak truth into our lives, asking for God's help where we need it. Let us pray the prayer of confession together. Holy God, when we think that expansive life is about power, teach us a new way. Gracious creator, when we think that expansive life is about material wealth, teach us a new way. Gracious author, when we think that expansive life is about control, teach us a new way. Teach us to live as you live. Teach us to love as you love. Forgive us when we don't. Gratefully we pray, amen. And now hear the sound of your baptism this morning. And receive these words of forgiveness for you and for me. Siblings in Christ, no matter how many times we mess up, no matter how far we wander, no matter how lost we feel, God's grace is full to the brim. It overflows in desert places. It finds us where we are, and it covers us in mercy. Speak and believe this good news with me. God's love is overflowing. We are drenched in mercy. Thanks be to God. Amen.
the spirit of that love, I invite you now to pass the peace to one another in a social distanced and consensual manner. <laughs> May the peace of Christ be with you. Go and do likewise. Peace, peace everybody. Peace. Peace of Christ be with you, Julie. Peace to all of you on phones and other devices. Thank you, Eldon. <laughs> Peace of Christ be with you, Anne. Peace be with you, Carly. Peace be with you, Peter and Lisa. Peace of Christ be with you, John. Fine, that's fine. And also to you, Al and Helen. Welcome to Brown Memorial. My name is Michelle, and I'm so glad that you're here worshiping with us this morning. We are worshiping in a hybrid fashion, and you will be muted on Zoom unless we're doing the Lord's Prayer or during the fellowship time after the service. So if you're visiting today, either in person or on Zoom, please let us know you're here, either by introducing yourself in the chat on Zoom or introducing yourself to someone here in the space. To stay informed about everything that's happening at Brown, I encourage you to review the announcements and the prayers found at the back of your bulletin using the link provided in the chat or your physical copy of your bulletin here in the sanctuary. There are a few items I'd like to draw your attention to that are happening in the next week. I wanted to remind you that the All Church Retreat registrations are still being taken, so don't miss out on this weekend of reconnection and fun and fellowship. It, it is the first weekend of April, April 1st through 3rd, and the cost is only $30 per person. You can use the link in your chat window to register, or you can contact a member of the ministry staff, and we will get you all set up. Lent officially began this week on Ash Wednesday, and we will continue with the Vespers service we did last year at 7 p.m. throughout the season of Lent. So please look on the church calendar for the Zoom link for that. That Vesper service will be entirely virtual. We will start candle lighting again, a much loved prayer tradition here at Brown, which we haven't practiced in a while. And we will be lighting candles during prayer throughout Lent. 
and that will start um, very soon. So if you are also online, please make sure you have candles at the ready so you can participate at home. Our Lenten Adult Ed series on Dying Well, called Remember You Are Dust, continues throughout Lent. We had a full class this morning, both online and in person, and a very robust conversation. So please join us for that at 9.30. It is for adults of all ages. It is hybrid, so you can join from wherever you find yourself. Today is Communion Sunday, which I imagine you have already guessed. But if you need to grab your elements, now is a great time to do so at home. The bread and the cup are both gluten-free and non-alcoholic, so everyone can partake of the Lord's Supper this morning. You'll receive the elements um, up at the front and then come back and take them together at your seats. Now I'd like to invite the children to come forward to have a special time with Pastor Andrew right here in the front. Testing. Aha. Uh -huh. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. <laughs> all right. Technical difficulties. I'm glad to see you all today. And I wanted to tell you guys a story from the Bible that we're going to hear. And it's a story about Jesus going into the wilderness. It's dangerous, right? I'm glad you knew that. And Jesus goes out in the into the wilderness, and it gets even more dangerous because the devil meets him there. The devil, yeah, the devil tempts him. He tempts him in three ways. The devil says, um, Jesus, I know you're really hungry, so why don't you take this stone and turn it into bread? Use your power and turn it into bread. And Jesus says, nope, the Bible says that we shouldn't live just, just by bread, so I'm not going to use my power to do that because he knew that his power was for more than just magic tricks. So then, after that, the devil took him up to like a big hill where he could look out on all the different cities and the kingdoms. And the devil said, I will give you power over all of these kingdoms if you just worship me. And Jesus said, no, I know the Bible says you should only worship God, and so I will not worship you. So the devil said, darn, okay, so the devil then took him up to the top of a tall building and said, I know you're really brave, Jesus. I dare you throw yourself off this building and command God's angels to catch you, to catch you. And, and Jesus said, no, the Bible says don't put, the God, don't put God to the test. Because Jesus knew that being brave is more than about just answering a dare. So I have a question for you all this morning and to think about at home this morning. Which, which of the three temptations do you think uh, was hardest for Jesus to say no to? Was it turning the stone into bread? Was it saying that I won't take all the power to have power over all these kingdoms? Or was it the dare, saying no to the dare? Which, so if you think it was um, the stone to bread, raise your hand. Does someone want to tell me why they think? There are a lot of people who think the stone to bread, okay. Um, I think it's stone to bread because um, like, 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 um, white bread. White bread. <laughs> so 
it feels like a really like fluffy white bread. Woo. Yeah, I agree. Okay, other other thoughts? Um, uh, I think that um, if he was actually hungry, and then then um, then uh, I think that it would be hard to turn off an offer of food. Right, it would be hard to turn down an offer of food if you're actually like really hungry, right? Those other things kind of seem a little extra maybe, but, but not the food, right? Okay, raise your hand if you think that the hardest thing to turn down would have been power over all the kingdoms. <laughs> power over all the kingdoms? Who wants to share? You want to share? some people because some people really love power and they want to um, have power over everybody, but maybe not Jesus. Some people really love having power. Wow, that was, that was so prophetic. Okay, here we go. The The bread turned into stone white. The bread turned into the stone white. Interesting, all right. And which of you think that the last um, throwing himself off the building as a dare which of you think that was the hardest to resist? Yeah. Rowan, you think that was the hardest? Do you have thoughts about that? Do you know why? No, you don't want to share? Okay, that's fine, yeah. That's good. So, so um, you're thinking that that was the hardest one. All right. Do you have something you want to say about that one? And it's kind of tempting because, like, yeah. Did someone dare to do something? Yeah, and, like, yeah, and like like he said that the angel would catch him, but I I I think like um that um like in the Bible it says that that don't um like trust God to do things for you. And um yeah. Right, so don't put God to the test, right? So I love your thoughts and ideas, and what I love about this story is that Jesus is able to make good choices. And sometimes, I think that's some of the hardest part of living, right? Um, sometimes we are tempted with, um, maybe not so much food sometimes, although sometimes maybe with food, but I think sometimes we're tempted with power, or maybe we're tempted to take on a dare, right? Or maybe we're tempted to make a choice that we know isn't going to be pleasing to ourselves or to God. And Jesus shows us that it's possible to make good choices. So I hope you will think about those choices for you this week. You probably have to make hundreds of choices every week. You may not even be aware of it. So I hope that you'll think about the choices that you make this week and um, know that God is always with you in your decision making. All right, I'm going to say a prayer. Um, this will be a repeat after me prayer, so please repeat after me. Loving God, thank you for your promise always to be with us. Help us make good choices. Amen. Thank you all for your thoughts this morning. You can go back or with Rachel. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. God of the wilderness places in our lives, it can be hard to hear you in the desert. It can be hard to hear you in the city, in the midst of our calendar reminders, rush hour traffic, and notification alerts. It can be hard to hear you, so we ask, make everything quiet. 
Pause the chaos. Still the rushing. Ease our racing thoughts. Give us ears to hear your word for us today, which promises that even in the desert, you are full to the brim. We are listening. We ache for your good news. Gratefully we pray. Amen. As you know by now, the scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke. Listen now for a word from God. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world, And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only God. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, The Lord will command the angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you do not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not Put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, the devil departed from him until an opportune time. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. O Lord, uphold me, that I may uplift thee. Amen. Jesus didn't even want to be in the desert. The Spirit led him there. This wasn't his idea. This wasn't his chosen fast. Few people choose the desert if they have a choice. Certainly not someone who spends most of his time around waters and fish and fields. In the desert, there is no thundering voice of God announcing your belovedness, no reinforcing words of pride to make you feel valuable and chosen. In the desert, Jesus knew he was alone and in need, led into the desert by a spirit only recently descended into his life, according to Luke's gospel. And the devil came to him. Not the little horned man in the red Halloween suit, in my mind, but the word we use to describe the way evil so often seems to be directed with purpose. Evil with purpose that seems to compete for our allegiance. The sort of evil that leads a man to dream up a pointless war in Ukraine and enables a military to unleash the hell that war creates. The sort of evil that led to slavery and still holds the hearts of many of us captive, oppressing generations of people of color here and around the globe. The sort of evil that carved up our neighborhoods by race and income years ago 
and still keeps hurting and dividing us. The devil came to Jesus because Jesus showed such obvious need. It seems that corrupt power often seeks out places of legitimate need. Corrupt power corrupts our desires, refashions it toward its own malevolent purposes. In the wilderness, Jesus was as needy as ever. He needed food. He needed power or agency. He needed protection. He needed companionship. And the devil was right there to please. Look for the places of legitimate need, and there you will find evil with a purpose ready to pounce. But Jesus says no to the devil's method of survival. One does not live by bread alone. Bread is important, but bread itself does not feed an empty soul. More stuff does not feed an empty heart. More stuff cannot mend a broken spirit. Self-preservation is an important value, but by itself, it does not make life worth living. Jesus says no to the devil's kind of power. There is only one God, and this God does not exercise power against human life and freedom, but for it. And Jesus says no to the devil's kind of success. He will not use God's name for his own personal agenda. Jesus says no because he knows that the devil's promises, as tempting as they are in the loneliness of the wilderness, won't meet the deep need that he actually encounters. They will only make things worse. It's, it's not that Jesus rejects the human need for bread or power or recognition and success. It's that he knows there are alternatives to the devil's way of meeting those needs. And I think the devil would like us to think otherwise. All you have to do is read the newspapers, walk the streets, listen to the either-or thinking that sometimes passes for reality. Just visit one of our many neighborhoods in our city where the conspiracy of race and fossil-fueled suburban fantasies hollowed out some of our communities over time. Here there is a legitimate need for protection. Here there is a legitimate need for security that comes through family bonds. And the devil has a strategy to meet that need. There's a legitimate need for jobs and decent wages, and the devil has a drug strategy to meet that need. There's a legitimate need to share anger with a world that doesn't seem to care, and the devil has a violent strategy to meet the need. And when we get tired of the violence, the devil has a stop-and-frisk policy just waiting to come back out of the shadows. Evil with a purpose has lots of strategies waiting in the wings. All we have to do is decide we are out of alternatives. Maybe you've seen the devil's work on the televised sins of the Russian invasion of Ukraine where ordinary civilians are facing down tanks and soldiers and their guns. Putin wanted power and the devil had a war strategy all planned out and ready to go. I pray that this plan doesn't lead more world leaders into the human fantasy that war is the best way to solve our problems. You see, the devil only gets to us when we convince ourselves that there is no other way to meet those needs. Temptation never finds us when our legitimate needs are fulfilled in life-giving ways. Corrupted power never comes to greet us when relationships are going well, our vocation is fulfilling, our personal or national security is stable, our contributions to the world are being affirmed. No, this kind of temptation only greets us when we are wounded and in pain, in need of power, 
or in need of acknowledgement or in need of human connection. This kind of temptation only greets us when we are alone and weakened in the wilderness, <clears throat> not of our choosing, and then decide that we are out of alternatives. <clears throat> and Jesus resists successfully. 40 days without food, and he resists, famished, hungry, lonely, hurting, and Jesus resists, maybe because he knows that with God, there are almost always many alternatives. The church has often taken the story, taken from the story, how different Jesus seems to be from us. Tempted as we are yet without sin, the book of Hebrews says, and I suppose that is true and maybe sometimes worth accentuating. But I think perhaps a more important observation for us this year is that Jesus seems to know that he doesn't need the devil in the desert to meet his legitimate needs. There are other ways to deal with your hunger in the wilderness. There are other ways to deal with your lack of power in the wilderness. There are other ways to deal with your loneliness, your need for connection in the wilderness. We worship the God of alternatives. Our theme for Lent this year, Full to the Brim, probably struck a number of you as odd, since so many of us are accustomed to thinking about Lent as a time of chosen deprivation. A wilderness time when we voluntarily give stuff up so we can sort of prepare ourselves to receive the grace that comes at Easter. And yet the authors of this theme pointed out that the texts that accompany our Lenten journey this year so often are texts of abundance and plenty. And those same authors pointed out that acts of abuse and injustice are often rooted in shame and scarcity. <clears throat> Mark Douglas, my ethics professor from seminary, wrote an article that arguing that Lent is actually practiced in most places. The way that it's practiced makes poor theological sense. Why? Well, because if grace is always a surprise, then how can you prepare yourself for that? Easter is a shock of divine goodness, Douglas writes, that reveals not the evidence of our worth or the magnitude of our efforts, but God's astounding power to which we can but whisper thank you and not, okay, now I'm ready. I think about all those Russian dissenters who have boldly opposed their dictator's heartless human disaster of war. Right before the war started, I heard people who know what they're talking about saying, there is no meaningful opposition in Russia. Grace is always a surprise. I think about the abundance of volunteer time, energy, and gifts that suddenly appeared when our Ministry of Welcome announced we had an opportunity to support Afghan refugees who are already here. Grace, surprise. I think about the joy that I felt this past Tuesday night with some of you playing a game of hide and seek in the sanctuary with our children and a few hardy adults who hadn't gathered together for a meal in nearly two years. Grace. Surprise. If there is a difference between Jesus and us, maybe the one worth noting this year is that Jesus believes grace can be found even in the wilderness. To be clear, no one wants to go there voluntarily, not even Jesus. Few people choose the desert if they have a choice, certainly not someone who spends most of his time around waters and fish and fields. And yet Jesus 
was never alone. At least that's the way I read this text. Remember, the Spirit led him there. The text never says that the Spirit left him there. People sometimes ask me, how is it that you seem to maintain hope with the world as it is, with COVID as it is, with the racial injustice in our country as it is, and the planet pushed to unprecedented levels, all by people grasping for power that isn't theirs to own? How do you maintain hope when the city can't get itself together or the violence goes on and on unabated? I've thought a lot about this question because I honestly don't really know. All my rational answers don't make sense at the end of the day. I feel as cynical and out of steam sometimes as anyone. But if I'm pushed to acknowledge what is actually going on inside of me, it is the real sense that I am never quite alone. There is always a presence always a force, always a good at work around me, beyond me, sometimes in spite of me, often within me that belies exp explanation, a surprising hope, a surprising support, a su surprising agitation, a surprising love. It's what we call grace. It's not of my doing. It's not of my believing. It is not of my preparation. It simply is. I hope you are able to feel it too. Please rise as you are able and join me in saying what we believe using the affirmation of faith printed in your bulletin. We believe God is love. We believe God's love is overflowing. We believe Jesus is a river. We believe that river is running toward us. We believe the Holy Spirit is a vessel we believe that vessel holds mercy for you and for me. We believe that wilderness is real. We believe the desert is lonely. We believe that Jesus has been there. We know that we do not walk alone. Even in the desert, we are loved. Even in the desert, God is with us. Even in the desert, this love overflows. Thanks be to God. Amen. Throughout Lent, we will be introducing a practice known as Visio Divina, Divine Seeing. Similar to Lectio Divina, Visio Divina invites you to meditate on a visual object to see how God might be speaking to you through it. Each Sunday in Lent, the bulletin cover will feature a piece of art to use for this practice. Today's work by Cravaggio from 1607 is entitled The Seven Works of Mercy. This piece of art illustrates the words to the offertory anthem and the litany of confession and the words of forgiveness. As you listen to the anthem, we encourage you to try this practice today. 
You can also find a more detailed guide to this practice in the bulletin insert. And now receive this call to commitment. The grace that God offers us is always a surprise. The grace that we offer each other is a surprise. But what's not a surprise is that that grace is always there waiting for us. So in this time of generosity, may you be surprised by the way God's grace meets you and those around us. Amen.
Join your hearts with me in prayer. Holy God, we thank you for the gifts of surprises. We thank you for the grace that meets us here. May the gifts that we give today be symbols of that grace as we share your love and care in this city and in the world. In your name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Jesus has always been the one to invite. He said, drop your nets and follow me. He said, let the little children come. He said, stand up from your mat. You are healed. Jesus has always been one to invite, and that has not changed. So friends, you are invited to this table each and every one of us, with our doubts, with our fears, with our scars, our joys, our dreams, our hopes, our questions, we are invited to God's table. And here we will be met. Here we will be fed. Here we are given a taste of an expansive life that is full to the brim with love, overflowing with joy. So come, not because you must, but because you can. Come, you are invited. The table is for you. Please join me now in the prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God who knows us, we are amazed by you. Your love never runs out. Your hope never runs dry. Your joy never gives up. We wish that we could be more like you in that way. In a world that loves scarcity, your abundance is shocking. In a world that knows fear, your joy is compelling. In a world that knows anxiety, your peace is captivating. We long for these things. So today we ask you, be with us on the hamster wheel. Be with us when compassion fatigue rears her head. Be with us when stress makes it hard to breathe. Be with us when self-doubt pushes in close. Be with us when exhaustion becomes constant or when loneliness becomes our primary language. Be with us and show us the way to the life you long for us. Show us a life of expansive faith. Show us a life of overflowing joy. Show us a life of absorbing beauty. Show us a life of engrossing purpose. So us, show us a life that is as honest and rich and meaningful as the one Jesus led. And until that expansive and holy day, we will continue to gather at this table. Until that day, we will continue to look for you in our midst. So pour out a double portion of yourself onto this bread and cup so that we might catch a glimpse of your goodness. God, we are amazed by you. Your love never runs out. So bring that never-ending love here. Together we pray in the spirit that you taught us, saying together, our maker, maker who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus was in a house having dinner with his friends. And he took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks to God, he, he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Every time you eat this bread, you remember me. In the same way, he took a cup, and he says, This is the cup of the new covenant. Sealed with my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this, remembering me. Friends, every time we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the death of our risen Lord until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. As we share the bread, we share these words, the bread of life, which we will do later. And as we share the cup, we share these words, the cup of salvation. The table is ready, and all that is missing is you.
As we share the bread, we say these words, the bread of life. The bread of life. As we share the cup, we say these words, the cup of salvation. The cup of salvation. Please pray with me. Holy God, we ask that you send us forth sharing what you have, while also preserving what is ours our well-being, our bodies, our inner truth. But we are at once ourselves and part of the beloved community. We are your signs and wonders in the world. We are the milk and honey. We are bound and we are unbound. In your name we pray, amen. For those of you with control issues, there are a few in this congregation, myself included. <clears throat> Let this Lent be a time of relinquishment, <clears throat> of recognizing that the deepest joy of the gospel is not something that we work hard to prepare ourselves for, but it is something that we give thanks to God for the surprising presence of grace that comes, even and perhaps especially in the most parched of places in our lives. So go forth from this place, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, and among you and between you, this day and every day of your gifted life.